Welcome back to another episode of Stories from the Shed. My name is Adam, your host, and with me again this week, a man who's lost every wet t-shirt contest he's ever entered. Jay I Cos- have beautiful tits. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Jake, how's it going, man? You said that was a good intro. I agree. That was good. <laughs> that was good. I'm good now. You're good now. You're I'm good, good now. now. So here we are. my tits. Well, not really. Said I lost. Well, it was a wet t-shirt contest and a main winner. It's ma'am. Ma'am. <laughs> How dare you? Don't assume my gender pronouns. <laughs> Just kidding. So Jake, man, what's up? Since the last time we recorded. Yeah, since we last recorded 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, my computer's working still, so there's that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'm a little bit warmer now. I'm Ed, noticing the heater's starting to die, but that's okay. Ed Kemper's saved. Ed Kemper's saved. On the computer. He's not saved in the eyes of Christ, though. No, oh, God, no. No, God, no, no. No, no pun intended. So, Jake, what are we drinking today, you're asking me? Jake? Well, what are, yeah, what are we drinking this time around? We're That's drinking a great question. Hoptress IPA by Baxter Brewing down the street oh, in Lewiston, Maine. Oh, no wonder I like it. It's local. So, Jake, don't get too drunk. You drank them switchbacks earlier, and now you're drinking the that Hoptress. That shit tasted like water, and then I switched to water, and water was better. Well, we'll see here. Listen, water. <laughs> <laughs> like... So this is a delicious IPA, I think. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoying this. This is much better. Yeah, we're going to give this one four and a half scully fingers. I'm cool with that. Yes. So what is our... Uh, second topic? Sepid sepid, to- sepid topic. Yeah, them beers are kicking in. That second topic of the night. Our second topic yes. is Johnny Gosh. Oh, gosh. Who's the- <laughs> Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go with the dad jokes. It is appropriate. You are a dad. <laughs> um, so yeah, Johnny Gosh, he disappeared September 5th, 1982. At the time, he was 12 years old, and it was in West Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, I've heard that's nice. Very quiet place. I've heard. He disappeared without a trace. Gone. Without a trace. Gone. They presumed that he was I kidnapped. I love your bars. Yeah. Are you rapping <laughs> now? As of 2019, there has been no arrest made in this case, but it is still considered open, so they haven't given up on it. Oh, well, that's good. Especially a case like this that's uh, gotten so much publicity over the uh, 36 37 years he's been missing right now johnny gosh had continually asked his parents if he could be a paper boy he wanted to earn some money to buy a dirt bike he wanted to go around with the neighborhood kids and with uh uh, others you know i guess it was fields they used to fly through and all that just country fields so it sounds like a you know typical thing a kid his age would want right at first they were kind of hesitant they thought he was too young they didn't really want him to do that but eventually they caved in. I mean, yep. the kid's learning a little bit of responsibility. He wants to put some money together, get himself a dirt bike. Right. Well, how often do you cave when your kid bugs you for six months on end or however long? You know what I mean? Well, right off the bat, as a parent, I'm actually impressed with a kid that wants to wants to do some work. And to be honest, Johnny had done the job for 13 months and hadn't missed a day. Wow. This is a reliable kid. I mean, Jake, yeah. you used to be wow. a paper boy. I mean, you're up early for that, aren't you? And what time oh, are you getting up? God, I'm up early now. But when I was a paper boy, I was getting up at... 3.30, and my mom and I actually did three paper routes uh, a couple couple days a week, and then I did some by myself, and she would let me drive from our house about a mile and a half down the road at 13 years old to go pick up the papers, and I'm assuming that Johnny had to go walk to go get his papers, too. Yeah, yeah. So would you assume that that's quite a, a responsibility for a 12-year-old kid? That's somebody uh, that de- that's done it yourself? Well, let's put it this way. My mom didn't want me to do it by myself at 13 years old, and I don't know exactly why, but... If she couldn't trust me, and I was one of those, uh, what do you call? What would you call that now? A free range kid or a latchkey kid, yeah, or right. Whatever the hell that is. You now. were able to roam, roam do you know, whatever a you normal wanted. Normal child. Yeah, I was able to do, go and do my own thing. But at three thirty in the morning, my mom was still like, ah, eh, nope, not happening. Well, Gosh actually got up early in the morning. Uh, he got up around five thirty in the morning, and uh, this was again on September fifth of nineteen eighty two. He brought his dash hound dog with him, Gretchen. Oh, wiener dog. Yeah, and they I left the house those. at five thirty p.m. Uh, yeah, he cut through the neighbor's yard and walked two blocks east to pick up the newspapers from a from a paper drop site on forty second and Ash Ashworth Road. Now, what exactly is that? Is that where they go to meet to get their their papers for the yeah. delivery? So, what the the newspaper will drop a bunch of newspapers to the different carriers for different different routes at certain locations. So this is probably where the paper was dropping for him. So that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Uh, so as he approached that corner, 
Mm -hmm. A man sitting in a late model two-tone car next to the paper drop where the paper boys would collect their papers for delivery, like you were saying. What color was the two-tone car? (sighs) What color was it? I want to say it was blue and gray. Okay. But I'm not 100% certain on that. That's important. You know what? There's been discrepancies on that, so I'm glad you bring that up. Okay. Well, that's an important detail. Because this is a thing. Most of the people that saw this were kids, and and, and even the uh, the adult that saw, you know, the the few adults that saw things, Mm -hmm. they didn't realize that this was going to be a major event. Right. This was just so some of this stuff gets lost. Right. Um, But as he is um, walking towards that that drop site, Mm -hmm. that two tone car kind of slows down and paces itself. To um, kind of meet Johnny as he's approaching the road. Oh, okay, weirdo. Yeah. What? Uh, so what he does is he asks Johnny uh, how to get to 86th Street. Mm-hmm. Now this street's about 20 blocks away from Cleve suburb of West Des Moines. Just a, another s- s- quiet area. Okay. Uh, but about 20 blocks away. Uh, Johnny gave him directions, and this guy made a U-turn on Ashworth Road, and he drove off. Okay, so problem solved. Well, that seems like a normal thing, and I mean, asking a paper boy, there's nothing that unusual about that yeah i guess not because they would know the area i mean they're delivering papers they have a certain route they gotta follow i mean that, that kind of makes sense that's right yeah so hey whatever who, who better to ask than a paper boy but a few minutes later johnny chatted with his friend mike at the paper drop so he hasn't even left the paper drop so he's probably just getting or walking to the paper drop when this guy just rolls up on him that's exactly what happens jake oh, okay. it's, it's on his way he, okay he gives a guy the directions yeah and he, then he go, and then he goes continues on to the paper drop and that's where he sees his buddy okay um this time he sees the car coming back. Yep. You know, it came back around from around the corner, but this time he leans out the passenger side window and asks the kids collectively, all of them there, how to get to 86th Street. Uh, after trying and failing to give him directions, Johnny approached John Rossi. Now, this is an adult neighbor uh, who was picking up newspaper bundles for his three sons. Oh, what a, excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm not really tired. Um, <laughs> what a nice thing for a dad to do. At least that way the kids can just get up and go deliver their papers. They don't have to go get the papers that's probably what my mom should have done when i was little yeah well this guy was uh nor- and normally johnny's father was with him yeah so right, i'm glad right. you bring that up so yeah that's right some <laughs> circumstance but reason by here he's not with him this day yeah, my mom did not make some very very intelligent choices yeah let your 13 year old kid drive to get the fucking newspaper he was <laughs> delivering so what the fuck so johnny asked mr ross if he could help uh this guy wants to know where 86th street is he asked yep uh, Rossi went to go help the driver, and Johnny returned with Mike uh, to go get their papers. But as they're going to do, as they're collecting their stuff, he mentions to Mike, he says, "This guy's kind of weird." Mm. So even a twelve-year-old boy is kind of picking up that there's something kind of odd going on with this guy. Mm. Now later on, uh, uh, the neighbor John Rossi, he states that he believes the guy was on drugs. Says this guy was high. He was high as fuck. Yeah. He told this to a newspaper, the Des Moines Register in 1983. Mm-hmm. He says that when you're drunk, you're drowsy, you kind of look sluggish. This right. guy was wide awake and he had beady eyes staring off into the horizon. Oh, maybe he was on coke. <clears throat> I don't know how that works. Well, I've he, never done coke. He, yeah, me neither. Oh, okay. He was well, on something. Good. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, so Rossi's speaking to the driver. Yep. Uh, Johnny's loading his papers into the wagon and he begins walking up 42nd Street. Rossi finishes his conversation with the man who begins to get agitated. Okay. He's noticeably aggravated. He mm-hmm. slides back into the driver's seat. And for some reason, Jake, now this is an older model car, so think about this. I'm hoping he had the bench seat because otherwise that would have hurt. He, he flicks. Now, this is a key thing. He flicks the, the dome light on and off mm. three times. Okay. And then he speeds off, they say, like a bat out of hell eastbound on Ashworth Road. He drove approximately, he, well, not approximately, he drove three blocks and turned onto 39th Street and bolting. And he just bolted north. Yeah, he just north. bolted north. Huh. Yeah. Uh, shortly after, a 15-year-old carrier saw a tall man walking out from the shadows between the two houses towards Johnny from behind uh, as he approached the corner of Marcotte Lane. Oh, Jesus. So, so what we have here, Jake, is we have that car with that guy acting kind of bizarre. Mm-hmm. Right? But even still, nobody, I think, is really thinking much of anything. Especially these right. kids. The guy's just weird, and it's 5.30 in the morning, and who knows? Well, a lot of weirdos are out going to Denny's. Yeah, yeah. You want to get you want to catch the weirdos at Denny's, go at like 2 in the morning. That's right, yeah. Go this, extremely intoxicated at 2 a.m. More like this guy's leaving Denny's. Yeah, that's what yeah he's thinking. on his way home to go throw everything up. Now that's, that's what they're thinking. So as this guy's taking off of the car, uh, another guy's coming out of the tree line and kind of following Johnny from behind. Mm-hmm. Okay? And this guy, now keep in mind, he did take a, did we say a right? He started just heading up 
uh, Marquardt Street. So I'm almost wondering if he's kind of going looping around towards where Johnny's walking. But anyway, so Johnny reaches the end of the block and crosses the street uh, to park his wagon on 42nd and Marquardt. Uh, this is where he Marquardt. Usually, Marquardt. My bad. Marquardt. Marquardt. Clarnell. Clarnell. <laughs> but anyway, so Charlotte this is uh, this. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this is a, a normal thing for him to do. Uh, this is normally where he will leave this. Right. And this is while he was uh, delivering to Frank or Frank Crest Circle. Mm-hmm. Now, a neighbor watches from his window as a silver Ford Fairmont rolled up and parked at the corner. So this is a definitive model right here. A Ford okay. Fairmont. Okay, a silver Ford Fairmont parks at the corner. Okay. But due to where his house is located, the positioning of it, he yep. can't exactly see what's going on. He sees the car go and pass, but he can't really see it. He does hear... Um, He does hear, you know, he knows Johnny's there because he could hear Johnny walking, and I believe he hears a little bit of maybe some talking, but what he ends up hearing is inevitably is a door slamming shut. Mm -hmm. When he looks out the window, he saw the car turn left onto 42nd Street, and it drove away. Johnny was gone. Oh, shit. Yeah, so all of a sudden— Where'd Johnny go? Well, that's the question. That's the question that's been baffling people here for years, especially his mother, Noreen Gosh, but we'll get more into that in a little bit here. Yeah, she makes some weird claims. Yeah. Now, at this time, nobody really realized there was anything wrong until about 7.45 in the morning. Yep. Um, when neighbors started to call Johnny Gosh's father, John Gosh. Huh. Uh, they were asking where their huh. newspaper was. That's an odd thing to do. I'm not going to lie. I think I would think as a, as a customer of a newspaper, you would call the newspaper itself, call the office, say, hey, where's my paper? It's kind of weird they're calling him. I mean, I guess that's good because they, that means they have a tight community. If they know Johnny's dad, they have his phone number, they're like, hey— Where's my paper? Where's Johnny? What's going on? It shows that they care a little bit more. Well, and I think it also shows that it's, this is a small, tight-knit community that right. they felt comfortable enough to call them, like you're saying. Right. So maybe it's that's just kind of how things were back in the uh, back in the 80s. Yeah, you maybe. Know, people it, knew each yeah. other. People were more friendly. Hey, you know what? I'm just going to call Mr. Gosh. Maybe there's something wrong with Johnny. We'll expect the newspaper a little later. Or right. It's probably something like that. But uh, this immediately struck the older Gosh as odd. And like we stated earlier— Johnny was known for being responsible, reliable, and he never skipped a day's work in 13 months. Right. You know, he'd been delivering for them for, for that for quite a while, and that's a long time for a young kid like that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Mr. Gosh finds his room empty and then noticed that the dog Gretchen had returned home. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So well, at least the dog came home. Dog's home. Uh, he began to search the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> well. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Keep going. You're saying it's not a total loss. <laughs> Jesus. It's not a total loss. Fuck. Jeez, Go Jake. Go ahead. So we return home, and uh, Johnny was gone. I they realized be- what I said after, <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. So Mr. Gosh, he's searching the neighborhood, right? Yeah. And he finds Johnny's uh, wagon yep. with all 37 newspapers in it. Not one had been delivered. Oh wow. So Gosh goes and he delivers Johnny's papers. Right. Uh, but he's he's concerned. When he, by the time he gets home, he's concerned, but he's not yet alarmed. He calls the police. Uh, gosh, then and think this is around eight thirty when he calls the police. But either way, it takes the police about forty five minutes to get to their house, mm-hmm. so that he can report him, his son being missing. Now I'm wondering what day this was. Like what day of the week? September fifth, nineteen eighty two was. I think this is a Sunday. It's a Sunday. Okay. A big Be- thick papers. Right, and I and obviously you and I know what happens in this story, but just as someone who doesn't know anything about this story, I'd be like, well, maybe he went to school. You know, I don't, right. I, you know what I mean? It depends on what day it is, I guess. Well, you bring up a good point because a lot of people, you know, like like it's you know the police believe Gosh was a runaway, so they probably thought that he was uh, you know playing with his friends or doing something. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no nothing that suggested that Gosh had been kidnapped at this point. Oh well, that's good. Yeah. Wow, that played perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> um, they turned little evidence, and no suspects were were found, especially as of immediately. I mean, a lot of this all becomes speculative from this point on. Right. Now, a few months after his September disappearance in 1982, Noreen Gosh says that her son was spotted in Oklahoma. So what 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 happens is there, there's a convenience store, and this woman's walking in. Mm-hmm. And a boy runs up to her and says, I'm Johnny Gosh, help. And uh, Wow. Yeah, right? That's a bold claim to make. Well, she's looking at the boy. She's kind of baffled. Mm-hmm. She, no sooner these two guys go and they grab him right. and, and throw him back into a car. What the hell? And speed out. Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? Weird. Yeah, and in that moment, like, what do you, your first reaction is not to be like, get plate number, get this, get that. You know what I mean? You're just kind of in shock. You're like, holy shit. Especially if you know about the story, you're like, I, dude runs up to you and says, I'm Johnny Gosh. Holy what? shit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what's... Wow, wow. Yeah, right? Like, you don't even know what to do initially, I'm sure. Of course. Now, before we go any further, Jake, why don't you tell us about the, uh, there's three, I guess, bullet points of this disappearance. The, well, there's, the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll go however you'll say it, however yeah. you would say that. But you know, there's three key factors of this that we got to keep in mind. Yeah. We got to talk, or we got to keep in mind about the, uh, the blue car, the two-tone blue car, uh, and that weird driver that kept asking Johnny how to get to 80, 82nd street or whatever it was, um, we have the silver car driver, but we don't have well, any Well, somebody with that him. blue car, somebody does note that um, this car, this two-tone car, this blue and light blue kind of vehicle, yep. has Iowa County plates. It's got a plush interior with a vinyl top. So they do have some information. No vinyl top. No vinyl top. I'm sorry. According to the witness, the man himself appears to be Caucasian or Hispanic. Now, keep note of that Hispanic thing because that might come up a little bit later in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy's in his mid forties. He's around five foot nine, hundred seventy five pounds. That's a hard fucking thing to tell when somebody's sitting and he's unshaven. Yeah, right. So that's what we got on that car. And then, then next, I'm sorry, next would be the silver car. Yeah, the silver car. Um, there's no physical description on the driver, but uh, people are pretty confident that it is a 1979 through a 1982 Ford Fairmont with a wide black stripe along the side of it. At the time. Um, investigators seem to place the most importance on this suspect since they were parked at 42nd and Marcot, Marcourt. Marcourt. We both screwed that up. Uh, now. It's just Marcourt. Living yeah, well, up yeah. here, everything's Marcourt. So <laughs> yeah, right. That or Sear or freaking yeah. some other French stupid name. And uh, at the exact time Johnny was last seen, so the car was there. The car was supposedly spotted there when Johnny disappeared. So that's why the police were very, very focused on trying to find the silver car. Right. It's like they're trying to narrow everything down to a small circle of of actual facts. Right. And, and then lastly. speculation out. Right. Lastly, we have the man on foot that was seen walking out between the two houses. Um, he was only seen by one person from what we from what we understand. Um, the only physical description that we have on him, though, was that he's just taller than Johnny doesn't know by how much um he just see it just seems like a weird occurrence definitely a strange occurrence yeah but only seen by one person I wonder and this person must be very confident that that's what they saw right well this person seems kind of wishy-washy on it um according to one early article about the disappearance the witness that claims to see this person couldn't be entirely sure that he wasn't the same guy who drove the blue car at the time, you're seeing the person on foot. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's what that's what the um the sus or the uh. So they're saying that person might have gotten out of the car to chase Johnny down potentially. It's possible. That's kind of what they're, they're yeah. Well, speculating that's what one, that's what one early article is stating that the witness said the one person that saw the guy. He goes, I, I guess, you know, I can't I can't tell. It's dark. Sure. It's five thirty in the morning. All I know is that it's just that he's taller than Johnny. Well, shit, that changes and he started the dynamics walking behind Johnny. That changes the dynamics altogether because they, you know, most people think it's a three-person operation. You got a point that there's a potential that this could only have been a quick two-person snatch and grab of a of a, of a kid. Right. Well, we don't know if that car might have been parked a couple streets down, and you know. Now, after all this, uh, everything kind of goes cold. The the gotchas they scour the neighborhood. They have neighborhood searches. They check, you know. Um, waterways and they do all that regular t- search that they do whenever somebody goes missing right but it turns up absolutely nothing uh over the years though they hire private investigators um i guess renowned ones a, re- a retired new york city police detective and a retired uh, los angeles F- uh, fbi um investigator wow out of los angeles even yeah so they i mean these these are not like you know slouchy investigators they, they right they're they're legit. Yeah, and and nothing, nothing right. came. Can't find anything on him. Um, little fun pat. Excuse me, I'm dying here. This beer is killing me. <laughs> um, fun fact about Johnny. Oh my God, what's going on here? Um, fun fact about Johnny for like the fourth time, he was one of the first kids to be put on a uh, milk carton. Uh, his parents actually worked with one of the uh, one of the. Who's who's the dude? Um, America's Most Wanted. 
John Walsh. John Walsh. Worked with John Walsh. Yep. And um, this family and John Walsh and some other families started the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That's right. And at the same time, Johnny and uh, a couple, uh, two other kids were put on milk cartons. And that actually started that whole missing children being printed on milk cartons thing going. Etan P- P- uh, Pats was the first, and I believe he was in New York. But yeah, uh, Gosh was alongside with uh, Juanita Estevez. Yep. So yeah, and that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. Now uh, that was actually I, I want to say, uh, Mr. Gosh got that ball rolling for his son in that area. By he he personally went to a uh, milk, uh, a dairy. I don't know what you would call it, dairy plant. Oh no shit. Yeah, so he was uh he was a big proprietor of that. Huh. So another interesting thing as the investigation went on, um, in 1985. John and Noreen Gosh uh, were given a dollar bill, and it had uh, I Am Alive written on it. And uh, they announced the same day that they'd be willing to trade $400,000 um, in reward money to try to find their son. Yeah. So $400,000 reward helped me find my kid. And that dollar bill was also signed Johnny Gosh. And uh, Noreen Gosh had uh, stated that that was definitively his signature now you'll say she she'll find a lot of things definitive Mm -hmm. as as we go on uh but that wasn't the only thing you know other kids started uh going missing in that area too jake yeah there was another kid that went missing on august 12 1984 uh his name was eugene martin and he disappeared uh while delivering newspapers on the south side of des moines uh no one was able to prove a connection between him and johnny though um but Noreen Gosh really is asserting that she was personally informed of the abductions a few months in advance by a private investigator who was looking for her kid. Um, she was told the kidnapping would take place the second week of August 1984 and would be a paper boy from the south side of Des Moines. Then why wouldn't she have notified somebody to That's have it stopped? That's a really good question. Why wouldn't you have done something? Or why wouldn't the person who told her that, who was one of her private investigators, quote-unquote, have said something to the cops. Of course, at least like, hey, you know what, guys? I gotta, I have knowledge that something's gonna happen. Send a few more squad cars out for right. the next couple even of weeks. You, even if you don't just give it away, just say, hey, I'm pretty confident something's gonna happen. I'm a PI. I think you guys should be patrolling a little more. Just be on the lookout. But instead, they say nothing. Right. They just don't. Supposedly, they don't do anything. I don't know. It, it seems kind of fishy. Very weird. Yep. And then again, not quite two years after Martin's disappearance, a 13-year-old Mark, uh, 13-year-old boy, another one named Mark Allen, told his mother he planned to walk to a friend's house down the street, uh, but he never arrived to his, at his neighbor's house on March 29th of 1986. Oh, Jesus. So there's three kids that have disappeared, um, two, two of which are, are paper boys. Mm-hmm. Then you have this other boy going to play, but still just vanish no trace right so i mean i know you can't maybe tie them all together but you could tie tie together the fact that whoever made all three of them disappear even if it wasn't different people knew what they were doing because they left no trace behind right well it's it's weird that they're all paper boys in a way but at the same time i guess if that's if that's your thing i guess it kind of makes sense because when you're when you're if, if you're fucked up and trying to kidnap someone i mean why not do it under the cover of darkness? I, well, I don't know. It's it's just an odd thing. You got a point there about the cover of darkness because two of them were paper boys and they would they were grabbed in the morning. Oh, that's right. Now, the, but the other one, he was not a paper boy, but I, it was in the evening under the cover of darkness. But one thing that they all have together is they were around the same age. Mm-hmm. They were 12, 13 years old. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That is true. Now, from then on, it kind of runs off to some kind of speculation and such. But before we start talking about Noreen and all that, why don't we take a quick beer break, Jay? I'm cool with that. All right, sounds good. I think we need another one, but that's okay, too. Yeah, we'll take another. We're doing it. And we're back from that beer break. Delicious. Okay, where do we uh, where do we leave off here? I think we left off. We were about to talk about Noreen Gosh. Oh yeah, and all the claims she makes about her son. Um, I just want to preface this by saying that you never want to doubt a parent when they talk about their kid, to an extent, I guess, because there's definitely some times where the parent doesn't really know the kid, especially when they're a teenager. 
let's be honest, teenagers only tell their parents so much. But you you got you got to hear this this lady out. Her kid's missing, you know what I mean? Like I said, you never really want to doubt a parent when they talk about their kid, but some of the claims she makes seem kind of kind of odd. Like we talked about uh, a few minutes ago where she supposedly knew about another abduction earlier but didn't say anything. It's just kind of weird. That is weird, you yeah. Know? Yeah, and there's other things that she does and I mean we're not going to say she's weird, but there's other things she does that are kind of like I wonder why she she handled it that way. Yeah, right. Like there, you know, I could have seen a different route that might have worked a little better. Would have made more sense. Thing. Yeah, right. But again, we're not going to discount anything she's saying. Um, these are just claims that she's making, but I don't know if anything has actually come of them. Right. Um, according to Noreen Goss, she was awoken at 2.30 a.m. one morning in March uh, 1997. Someone was knocking at her apartment door. She opens the door, and Johnny Goss, who is now 27... Uh, standing at her door, accompanied by some weird, unidentified-looking dude. Somebody, some guy with him. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Some John Doe-looking dude. Um, Gosh says she immediately recognized her kid because he uh, he had opened his shirt and revealed a birthmark on his chest that she had known about. Right, and you can't fake that. Yeah, right. Uh, she go. She had said that they had talked for about an hour and a half. Um, he was with the other this other guy, but I had no idea who he was. Whenever she would ask him a question, Johnny would have to look over to him for approval to speak. That's kind of weird, right? Trying to keep him uh, keep him quiet. I mean, if you're if this guy or this organization is that terrified of of getting caught or that to the point where they're not where they're going to make him ask for you know permission to speak, then why would they even go to her house? Well, why would they take him to her house to begin with? It just seems kind of odd. Yeah, it it's kind of weird. Um. So he would look over for the other man for approval to speak. Um, he didn't say where he was living or where he was going, but he asked his mom not to say anything because he was afraid that they would kill him. So she doesn't say anything. Right. That's weird. Why didn't she... I mean, you you know, we've talked about this before when we were getting ready for this. Why wouldn't she have grabbed a... You know, it's 1997. She probably had a cordless phone. It's possible. Why didn't she go into another room and, and call the police, call 911, and just leave the phone there? They're going right. to show up. Right, exactly. Oh, there's somebody called, you know, if you call 911, you just leave the phone. They will show up there. And I would imagine it was easier to trace a landline and still is. I mean, you can track cell phones down to the exact location in 2018, 19, whatever yeah. this is. But even then, I'm sure it was pretty easy to trace a landline back to a specific address. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, they leave. She doesn't say anything, keeps her mouth shut, blah, blah, blah. What happens in 05? Well, in 2005, uh, in an interview, uh, she states that the night that he came here to her, to her house, mm -hmm. he was wearing jeans and a shirt and had a coat on because it was March. Uh, it was cold, and his hair was long. It was shoulder length, even, uh, and it was straight and dyed black. So the one was kind of alluding to them. Oh, trying so to... like a My Chemical Romance kind of look. <laughs> That's weird. So no, after the vi after the visit, she had the FBI create a picture saying Johnny was a was a goth kid before goth kids were cool. Yeah, right. That's fucked up. Well, they did that, you know, metal kid. But no, it sounds like you know she's saying that they made him change his appearance to some degree. Yep. Keep keep him dyeing his hair, looking different. Uh, right. Because people are, keep him unidentifiable. People are still looking for him. Right. Uh, and she also writes a book in two thousand. Uh, so this was five years before. It was uh, uh, why Johnny can't come home. But in that. Uh, in in the book, she also uh, talks about the understanding of what her son's going through based on the investigative searches that have been conducted by private investigators for for her. Um, and this kind of leads to some other things going on in September of two thousand and six. Jake, yeah, um, on September first of two thousand and six, Gosh got some photographs left on her front door. Uh, some of these pictures depicted uh, three boys bound and gagged on a bed, and one of them appears to have Johnny in the far right corner of the picture, bound and gagged on a bed. Now, was she able to uh, identify this as Johnny by that birthmark, you're thinking? Because there's three kids. There's three I boys. Uh, the, the one in the very far end is supposedly Johnny in the picture. Well, they're all clothed in the picture. I believe I remember looking. I remember seeing the picture online while I was doing research, but I believe they were all clothed. I just can't confirm that. Um, she later said, though, that the first two photos that she had gotten, so she had gotten three. Uh, they had 
originated on a website um, featuring child porn, which is kind of gross. Well, you get three boys tied up, gagged. I mean, I guess this is where they start to think, you know, maybe he wasn't abducted and murdered. Maybe there was something else that had happened. Mm -hmm. Although uh, John's father, at this time, I believe him and Noreen are divorced. Mm -hmm. Um, And I believe that he questions it. He says that the boy's feet are far too small to be Johnny's feet, even at the time he was abducted. Oh, okay. So even in that, and and watching interviews with John Gosh, he still has a great relationship with Noreen. Yep. uh, But... You know, when a child goes missing, it, it does put a strain on a relationship. And I so, can only imagine. Yeah, unfortunately, that's what had happened. So a lot of things that Noreen claims, uh, John Gosh, uh, you know, will say, I don't know. I don't think so. Right. And, and I well, think a lot of that led to a lot of their problems, well, according to what he says. Well, I can definitely see that because um, she had also said that while looking at the pictures, um, she had seen the three boys tied up on the bed, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of them has a picture of, or has a, a, I guess a section, a piece of it, whatever that shows a man, um, possibly dead who appeared to have something tied around his neck. Um, she alleges that the man was one of the perpetrators who molested my son. Now, how would she know that? And that's kind of where I'm getting at. Maybe I could, you know, I can see where she's going with it. Like I, I can see the logic train. I see how she got there. But you can't make that. I, I don't know. I just I don't feel like you can make that assumption because you you don't know. She does make a lot of assumptions. But can you blame her? No. Look at what she's going well, through. She's searching for answers. Answers. Right. She's still searching. For yeah. Answers. She's very upset. Her son fucking disappeared. She's very very upset. And I would say I still would think she's justified in making those those conclusions or jumping to those conclusions. But she doesn't know. In, in the end, no one knows, and that's what sucks. Do you think that every time she, something like this happens, she goes to the media? She seems like she's one that's in touch with the media, and this stuff goes out there, and it just kind of st- stirs those crazy people to come up and be like, ah, oh, let's fuck with this lady a little more. Let's see what we can do. I mean, maybe, but I would hope that people out there wouldn't do that type of shit, try people, to fuck with people People like do that. that all the time. That's fucked up. That's just how people are. Now, Jake, on September 13th of that same year, there was an anonymous letter that was mailed to the Des Moines Police Department. Yeah, it was only 12 days later. Yeah, do you have? Did you? were you able to find that letter? Yeah, I got it right here. Uh, gentlemen, someone has played a reprehensible joke on a grieving mom. The photo in question is not one of her son, but three boys out of Tampa, Florida, about 1979 to 1980, challenging each other to an escape contest. There was an investigation concerning that picture made by the Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office. No charges were filed and no wrongdoing was found. The lead detective on the case, uh, his name was Zalva. Zalva. His, Zalva. Z a l v a. With Connell. Con with Connell. I'm, I'm done. No more Connells. All right. No more Connells. <laughs> um, this this allegation should be very easy uh, to check out and verify. Uh, Nelson Zalva was the uh, was the what the hell's his name? The detective. Um, yes. The, his, his name, his position, excuse yeah. me. Um, I know where you're going with that. Yeah. He was the detective for Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office in the 70s, and he said the details of the letter were true, and he also adds um, that he investigated the black and white photos in 78 or 79 before Gosh's disappearance. I interviewed the kids, he says, and they were of no coercion or... Uh, they said there was no coercion or touching. I could never prove a crime. Uh, when asked for proof that this was indeed the same photo from the investigation nearly three decades prior, Zalva could not provide any proof. So wait, man. So are you saying that he's saying that somebody took these pictures of these kids, but that nothing bad necessarily came of it, nothing bad necessarily happened? Right. Well, yeah, I kind of think that's what he's – I kind of think that's, that's kind of how saying. I take that, but that's kind, well, of, no, kind of weird in, of, in and well, of itself. I mean, if you're interviewing the three kids – and they all say, no, nothing's happening. I, I think don't the, know. The picture says something's happening. Well, right, but if it is an escape contest, you, you, we really don't know. And uh, not to go off onto a side note here, but in, this was in Florida. Right. I ha- was in researching for stories to do, um, came across a woman, a story about a woman who found sim- very similar pictures. Uh, it was a pictures of two two kids, a, a a little girl and a boy, mm-hmm. bound and gagged. It was like a Polaroid picture, just left in a uh, mall parking lot. Wow! So, and that was in Florida. 
Huh. So, I mean, these kind of bizarre things do Only happen. Only in Florida. Only in Florida. Only in Florida. I love it. Can you see this as the title of like a Florida man meme on Reddit? Yeah, I know, right? Good God. Now, this, uh, because uh, Noreen continued to push and push and, and like we stated earlier, the um, time that they've invested with, um, what was his name, John Walsh and all, and all this, yeah. this continued to gain national interest. Right. Uh, this case generated... Uh, uh, so much national interest that Noreen Gosh was able to establish the Johnny Gosh Foundation in 1982. Oh, nice. Yeah. I didn't even know that was a foundation. That's cool. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? All uh, right. She visited schools and spoke at seminars about uh, sexual predators. So she was really taking it down that av- avenue. She even lobbied for the Johnny Gosh Bill, a uh, state legisla- legislation uh, which would mandate an immediate police response to reports of missing children. Oh. The bill became law in Iowa in 1984. Now, that's great because, I mean, Jake, we've covered a few stories um, just recently here where people call, well, Johnny Gosh, of course, mm-hmm. you know, but even like Kimberly Moreau and other ones. Right. And it's taken as runaway. Right. Runaway or run away. Be back. You can't report it for 48, sometimes 72 hours. Yeah, I think that was the case with Mora. Yeah. Not Mora. Um, well, yeah, Mora too. Well, but, um, Mora, they didn't take it serious, and that was even in the two thousands. I, I was trying to, I wasn't trying to go with Mora. I was trying to go with Moro. Kim, Kim yes. really Moro. Kim yeah. Moro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you see where I fucked yeah. that up. No, no, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in August of nineteen eighty four, Noreen testified and sent in a Senate hearing on organized crime, mm-hmm. speaking out about organized pedophilia. So groups of oh, so people. like Hillary Clinton pizza Pizza Gate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is the nineteen eighty four Pizza Gate. She uh, and it's alleged that in her role, uh, she started to receive death threats. We're just kidding, Hillary. <laughs> yeah, don't come find us in the shed. Please don't. She has a supposed long hit list. So she kind of kept going, and she pushed on with uh, with a lot of this. And uh, she was even inv- invited to the White House by President Ronald Reagan then at the time. Holy shit! Yeah, and they had a declaration and a ceremony as these changes came into play and changes for the better. Right. So some of the other stuff that we have with um, as all of this is going going on, I mean, you can't eliminate some of the information about a guy named Paul Bonacci. Yeah, he kind of comes into play later in the story. Um, while while uh, Noreen is going about the country talking about um, sex predators and kidnapping and all this stuff and doing her thing with the Johnny Gosh Foundation, um, 21-year-old Paul Bonacci in 1989 comes out to his attorney and says that he had been abducted into a sex ring with gosh as a teenager and was forced to participate in gosh's kidnapping so just randomly this kid out of nebraska this 21 year old kid out of nebraska um tells his attorney that he kidnapped johnny gosh so how old would this kid have been if he's 21 in 1989 how old would he have been the year that johnny gosh was 80, abducted. 80. Johnny Gosh was abducted in 82. Yeah. So minus 7. 14. Yeah, you would have been 14. And and didn't they state that the person that was on foot that was following Johnny Gosh through the woods mm-hmm. was somebody that all they could describe was slightly taller than him? Yeah. And if he helped with this, you could assume that this guy didn't have the driver's license. So if he did have any part in this, one would assume that he would could have potentially been the guy on foot? It's possible. So... Just something that hit me. Anyways, what were you yeah. saying, man? Oh, wow. That, I never thought about well, that. Well, you know, he would have been young, 14. He probably wasn't right. driving either of the cars. Yeah, right. And he wouldn't, theoretically, he would be slightly taller than Johnny. Johnny's 12. He's 14. Yeah. That. Yeah, wow. I never put that together. And if you're a 40 year old guy aging in your car, you're going to send the uh, 14 year old kid to go do all the running and the oh, physical stuff. Oh, shit. Yeah. So. And he, like, like the description in one of the, or the only guy that we really have a description of, he said he was kind of overweight. Yeah, the one in the car. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. All and right. He was overweight in uh, uh, huh two uh, and yeah. two. Yeah. Wow, that was that was a good connection. Good so, on you. Thank you for that. <laughs> you, no, really, like thank you for that. I never thought about that. That's uh, why we do this. Um, so he goes to his lawyer, says all this stuff. Uh, John Gosh met with him, uh, Johnny's dad, and believes he's telling the truth. Noreen meets him and says he told her things that he could only knew from talking. Uh, with Johnny. So this says a lot because uh, Mr. Gosh was one that's skeptical of a lot of the stuff that Noreen says. Right. And for him to believe um, somebody like Benacci, and you'll uh, we'll get into Benacci's character a little bit here, but mm-hmm. 
once you get the full picture of who Benacci is, to believe anything this guy says, that says a lot. Right. Excuse me. I'm sorry. The beer is kicking in even <laughs> worse than it already was. Um. So apparently, uh, Bernacci tells um, Noreen things that only he that only he would know if he knew Johnny personally. Um, he said that Johnny had a birthmark on his chest, a scar on his tongue, and a burn scar on his lower leg. Um, the birth the description of the birthmark had been uh, very widely circulated, um, but the information about the scars hadn't been made public. Okay. So how did he know? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Right. That's a good question. I mean, that's if you want to tie yourself into this. And the funny thing is, I believe at this time, like we said, he's sitting in jail, but I believe it's on lesser charges like burglary. Was so, it? so put yourself in in, oh, okay. in this mindset, right? Okay. He's in jail for something that he's gonna get out of. Yep. And as as he's sitting in jail, he's admitting to a crime that could keep his ass in jail. Right. For the rest of his life. Why would you do that? You have to have a reason to do that, and maybe he's thinking. He could take take something bigger down than himself. Is that that's kind of what that's, it seems I think, like? I feel like that's one of the very few, if only you know, if any reason at all to do it. Unless you're like Ed Kemper and you just think you're better in jail. Now, what do we know about Benacci? He is a man that's got some psychological issues. Yeah, you could hardly call him a man at 21, and you hardly call me a man at 26. But um, yeah, he's got a lot of psychological issues. He was known as kind of like a pathological liar. He also had six personalities. He was a yeah. multiple personality disorder. Yeah, and I remember reading something about him too, where uh, one of his psychiatrists was telling, I think it was one of the investigators for some case that um, John, what the hell's his name? Paul Bonacci. Paul Bonacci, yeah. Would it, he wouldn't quite lie to you, but he would tell you things in different personalities and to kind of just take it at face value really what does yeah. that mean well apparently does when that mean you, he's not lying to you on intentionally i i don't really i don't really know how how you would describe that but apparently there's videos of him um doing doing interviews and it's a very distinct change like you can not maybe not see it coming necessarily but you can see oh wow He's really different all of a sudden. It looked like a flick of a switch. He's acting one way, then all of a sudden, right, totally different person. Right, exactly. You almost wonder, question if he's doing that, like if he's if he's legitimately doing that or if he's faking it, because it's like so freaking weird to watch. But I mean, there are people that have these issues, unfortunately. Oh yeah, and they're all on the street thanks to emptying out all our mental institutions and places that could actually help these people and have the training, and have the, the space and the systems to work with these people. So, so you got to keep that in mind that this is Paul Bonacci's character. This is who he is. And the gosh but is one of his six, one of his six, but the gosh is believe him. So, right. I mean, that says a lot right there. And what else have we got here on this guy? Um, he accused a Republican party activist and businessman. Uh, his name was Lawrence E. King Jr. Larry King, Larry King, not, not Larry King, the, the TV host. We like him. Don't sue us. Please don't. We like him. Um, he also served as the director of the Franklin Credit the Franklin Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Bonacci accused him of running an underage prostitution ring and making him a victim at a very early age. Um, it didn't take long for a grand jury to decline to charge him, however, um, finding the allegations to be a carefully crafted hoax. Paul Bonacci and Alicia Owen... I'm assuming another inmate. Yeah, I think so. Um, were indicted on state perjury charges because of this, and uh, federal grand jury also declined to indict anyone for child prostitution. Wow. So you have to wonder if that if that's I, I now now I'm gonna go on out on a limb and say what if it's a cover up? It you know. <sighs> well, here's the thing: is that I don't know some of the stuff that Benacci says is that these kids are are abducted. Mm -hmm. and they're branded and the brand i can't remember what he calls it the swinging oh it's x. the rocking x the rocking x yeah it's uh it's an x with like a almost like a quarter moon underneath yeah. it and the the tips of the bottom of the x touch this touch this little moon what would make it rock right exactly and so they're branded with that and now this is an organization that abducts children and sells them at a high price to politicians and other rich well off corporate people mm -hmm. and the cheaper i mean the uh the younger and the more innocent the child 
the more money they fetch for them. Ugh. You know, and yeah. like somebody like Benacci at 14, not that young, you could use him to. He's, Can we? Yeah, that's enough. You know, well, you're we, 14. We don't, you, no, that's, you go that's off good. And that's do that. good. Thanks. Thanks. Too much. But another thing that Benacci was able to. I know you guys to, can't see it, but I'm actually covering my face right now. <laughs> another thing that Benacci uh, was able to do is he was able to lead police to a house in Nebraska, like a, a farmhouse in the middle of a open farmland. Yep. And once they were there. Isn't that um, all Nebraska is, is farmland? I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But once they were there, they um, there were some doors, like storm doors uh, attached to the house. And you go in there, and it leads to like a cave. What? Yeah, like an area where he said they would store kids, what? shackle them, and keep them in there. What the fuck? And, uh, you know, to keep them ready for, for sale. Yo, listen, if any house goes to a fucking cave, it should have been that A-frame house that was in the Maura Murray, Maura Murray store. Room. Yeah, well, this is a big farmhouse with a lot of places to hide kids, and he said they would bring them there. Wow. They would run them around from all over the country. And, Holy uh, shit. Well, I mean, if you're going to run them around from all over the country, I guess strategically being in the dead center of the country may not be a bad idea. Yeah. In fact, I find, uh, you know, in researching again, in researching for a lot of this, a lot of these crimes like drugs and sex trafficking, they lead from the middle of the country and they branch out outward. Build that wall. No, I'm kidding. Don't build the wall. Well, but it's, it's a been... waste of money. Don't build the wall. And so that's what it does. It, it branches outward. And so these kids are trafficked. All over the place, and it's believed that that's what happened to Johnny Gosh. Um, I also had read something that there was a rumor that Johnny Gosh, again, because these are politicians and well-to-do people that are doing this, mm -hmm. that later on in life, a guy supposedly being Johnny Gosh was a White House correspondent. Although they people looked really? into yeah, people looked into it, and and I think he even was kind of elusive to it <laughs> did he write a no i'm johnny gosh <laughs> no, fucking weirdo fucking weirdo but no he uh they were they were able to uh prove that he was not no i'm johnny gosh yeah gosh it's british british they, but they were able to prove that he wasn't the uh the actual johnny gosh hmm. well today i learned yeah so that's uh i relearned a lot today is that a that's probably what we got on johnny huh you got anything else to throw down on it i hope he comes home I hope so too. I hope uh, That's about it. just like a lot of the uh, episodes we do. The I wonder what happened to his dog. Gretchen hopefully died in old age. I hope so. I hope nothing bad happened to her. Out of this whole story, is that I think the... I care the most about Johnny, and then very close behind the dog. Is the dog your silver lining? The dog is a silver lining, but I kind of feel bad for the dog too. I don't know how close Johnny was with the dog, but if the dog would go out with him to go deliver papers and. Whatever. I'm going to assume him and the dog had a good relationship. Now now imagine being... Now imagine... I know this is stupid, but imagine being the dog and being like, oh, my best friend is gone. They say the dog was distraught. That's what John yeah. Gosh said. Yeah. I believe it. Can you just imagine what the dog's thinking? You know, the dog goes home and is probably like pacing back and forth and like you know, making whimpering noises and whatever. However, a dog handles being distraught. But that dog never got to see Johnny again. Yeah. And that kind of sucks for the dog. It also sucks for the family, obviously. We all know that. I just like animals, I'll be honest with you. In fact, Noreen still looks for uh, Johnny. Oh, okay. I was going to say, she still looks for the dog? No. <laughs> Not the, jo the dog's fine, but she still looks for Johnny. Um, I don't have anything to add about the dog, but what I do have to add is um, it would be kind of crazy to think that there is some huge organization that is abducting children and, and mm. storing them in these facilities mm. and selling them to rich politicians and rich people because all the people that would know about that and all the people that would be involved in such a thing, what are the odds that for so long they could shut their mouths? Because Johnny would be one of, one of hundreds, if not thousands of children's children that are abducted and brought into this, right. coupled with all these other people that are running this organization. Right. You're going to tell me that none of them have a momentary lapse and say, this is wrong. I'm going to say something. I just think a big enough. Well, I mean, you get, you get drug rings that go ginormous. But people and know don't about them eventually. Well, I mean, well, this right, is a but, long time. Okay. okay I mean, but this now, is stealing kids and police okay, looking it's for been kids. It's speculated and, that there has been a child prostitution. Excuse me. Jesus Christ. This beer is killing me. <laughs> R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Um, yeah. No shit. Right. Um. But it's okay. It's been speculated for years and years and years now, at least as long as I can remember, that there is a child sex ring 
operating countrywide. It's it's been a it's been a rumor for a long, 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 yeah. long, long time. What was the other one you were talking about? That yeah. Well, there was okay. That how hard it would be to keep it keep okay. Quiet and, oh and right. Not... And then I made a comparison to drug rings, and you said, "Well, they know about those." Okay. Well, there's rumors of drug rings. They yeah. don't, you know, they don't know unless it's on paper. And of course, they have paper proof of a drug ring going on. It doesn't appear that there's paper proof of a child sex ring, but if you can hide a drug ring for that long, what says that you can't hide a child sex ring that long too? And I'm not. It, it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. You could hide it, but if anything, it's probably a couple of smaller ones, so it's it's easy to break up, I guess. You know what I mean? It's like the opposite of what the economy is doing. You know, big companies are buying yeah. all the small companies and turning into one. Look at fucking Time Warner. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's now, like, I feel like, if anything, it would be the opposite. Would you say that, do you believe Johnny was abducted into the Rocking X and that the Rocking X is a real organization? Have well, you seen I, enough to prove that to you from your research on this? I've seen some brands. I, I, I haven't done enough research on the Rocking X and that whole thing just yeah. because I, I don't really – that's not something that I want GWI to sell as far as part of my uh, my internet search history when they go <laughs> to make some money. You know what I mean? They don't. Re- that's not something good that I want to find on my Shit. history. Since, since we've been doing this podcast, I hope nobody checks my internet search history. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um it's very possible that he that he got sold into a into a sex ring. I just I don't know. I don't I don't know enough about the topic. Yeah. I well, guess. If anybody knows anything about Rocking X or anything uh, interesting to share on that, they can send it to our Facebook or to our Gmail yeah. or to put a fucking comment on our YouTube. Do something. I don't give a shit. Hit us up with some information. I don't give a f- shit. Yep. <laughs> hey, while we're on the social media subject, do you want to uh or do you want me to do the honors? Well, you have the laptop in front oh, of you. Let's do it. Okay. So you can find us on Facebook. That'll be at uh, Stories from the Shed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram, Stories from the Shed podcast. Oh, that's the white girl's favorite social media. That's right. YouTube, Stories from the Shed podcast. Twitter, at Stories from Shed. I message sfts podcast at gmail.com. And that is also our Gmail. Send your emails to that. Send us uh, show suggestions. Send us reviews. P- re- fucking rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. What else are we are on YouTube? Yeah. Uh, Tell us what kind of beers we should drink. Yeah. Don't give us nothing like no switchback garbage ale that we that we drank earlier Yeah. for the second time. Keep the I good said stuff. I would never drink it the, sec- the second time after I drank it the first time, but... Fuck you, MacBook. I have to drink it again. And once again, if anybody knows anything about Johnny Gosh or anything uh, about any missing people, contact 1-800-THE-LOSS. The loss. And also contact your local police. Police. Yes. Whatever their number is. You can just dial 911 for a quick access. That's right. That's right. And as always, we'd like to thank you for listening. Yep. Tell Absolutely. a friend. Tell a friend. Tell, tell your dog. Tell your cat. Tell your mom, your dad, your grandmother, your cousins, your babysitter, whoever. Tell Tell them all to listen to us. Tell people with ears. All right. (laughs) Thank you. Wait, what about people without ears? Tell them too. 